the Lord of all the earth Who care to know my name Who care to feel my hurt Who am I That the bright and morning star Would choose to light the way For my ever wandering heart you've done and not because of what I've done but because of who you are I am a flower quickly fading here today and gone tomorrow a wave tossed in the ocean a vapor in the wind still you hear me when I'm calling Lord you can because of what you've done not because of what I've done but because of who you've done not because of what I've done but because of who you are I am a flower quickly fading here today and gone tomorrow a wave tossed in the ocean a vapor in the wind still you you catch me when Um, inadvertently, I forgot another announcement. So, uh, um, Randy Holly has let me know that uh, for those of you who were here last Sabbath and heard Pastor Larry Kanzler speaking and referring to an event that happened, um, uh, I guess a couple months ago, uh, to where there was a. Uh, 
a camp meeting, I think, or, or some sort of gathering um, at Kenneth Copeland's church uh, where he had a guest uh, speaker, um, Tony Palmer, a former evangelical uh, minister that has uh, come into the Catholic Church and is trying to... Um, um, actually uh, fulfill one of the prophecies of um, the Protestant Church grasping hands with the Catholic Church. Um, Randy has made copies of that, the first part or part one of that um, that meeting and uh, if, if you're so inclined to desire a copy, there are copies that are available um, just when you have the opportunity uh, to defray the cost. Uh, we're just asking for a $1 donation just to cover the cost of the disc and, and reproduction. Um, and I understand that part two is coming and may be available um, very soon. So if that's of interest of you, I've seen part one. It is very intriguing. So I encourage you um, to take a look at it. I, I do believe it's available online as well. Um, but it is very interesting to see the signs, signs of the times and prophecy um, being fulfilled and coming to pass before our very eyes. Amen. Um, so thank you for that and appreciate your patience. Um, can we bow our heads for prayer? Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I just thank you and I praise you, Heavenly Father, Lord, for this moment, for this assignment, Heavenly Father. I thank you, Lord, for all those uh, that pinch hit this morning, Heavenly Father, got out of their comfort zone and maybe fulfilled some tasks and some duties that they're not familiar with or haven't done before. But I just thank you, Lord, that this is all about you today. And it's for your glory, for your honor. And I come forth as your servant. Lord, I like to think of myself as wait staff today because you have prepared this message. You have prepared this meal, Heavenly Father, for the spiritual nourishment of our bodies. And I come forth as your servant. I ask that you anoint my lips today, Heavenly Father, Lord, to deliver that which you've imparted into me. Lord, that I might appropriately, Lord, be a good steward of time, Heavenly Father. And I just thank you, Lord, for those that are here in attendance. Lord, I pray you open each and every one of our spiritual ears to hear all that you have in store for us today. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Today's message, or the message that the Lord has given me to share today, is what is your assignment? What is your assignment? If you have your Bibles, I ask you to turn to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 25, I'm going to start at verse 31. Again, that's Matthew chapter 25, and we will be starting at verse 31. Flexibility, my glasses have disappeared. That's all right. Supernatural eyesight. Matthew 25, starting at verse 31. And when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels of him shall sit upon the throne of glory, and shall set the sheep on the right hand and the goats on the left, then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared of you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, send, when saw we thee, and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? And when saw we a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer, and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done unto one of the least of my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Even as a young child, this scripture... Um, I'll be honest, it kind of scared me. Um, I was probably even younger than my son, who's 12. And because even as those were kind of befuddled and thought they were actually ministering to Jesus himself and the opportunity to do so and whether they um, appropriately completed that assignment or not, um, 
and then the tables are kind of turned and it's like it's really not about me it's about my children and how you treat them even the world is kind to others I mean there are very benevolent folks out there very caring passionate people um, in all walks of life um, but we as Christians are charged to go a step above beyond the norm we who have been armed with the truth of this gospel um, have not only a civic responsibility but a spiritual one um, to replicate Christ's nature and his character I want to read two more passages and I'll kind of tie these all together and tell you where I'm going let's stay in the book of Matthew and let's go to uh, chapter 19 and we'll start at verse 16 again that's Matthew chapter 19 and we'll start at verse 16 And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I might have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said unto him, Which? And Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And the young man said unto him, All these I have kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? And Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, that thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Matthew 21, verse 28. Just a couple of chapters over. If you're there, say amen. amen. Matthew 21, verse 28 says, But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. And he came to the second and said likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Whither of the twain did the will of the Father? They say unto him, The first. Jesus say unto them, to them, Verily I say unto you, that the publican and the harlot go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward that ye might have believed in him. I take a look at the opportunities that were given, in this case, two sons and, and a rich young ruler. And I kind of pause and wonder and ruminate, what would I have done in those situations? Or what have I done in maybe similar situations? Um, it's nice to think that I've been well taught. I'm pretty well read in the Word of God. I have a prayer life. I'm surrounded with some wonderful people to fellowship with. And surely given a simple assignment, I'd do the right thing and go. But I wonder how many times that I've had a similar assignment that maybe I thought was not that big of a deal or maybe not as important of what I had pre-planned and just kind of shrugged it off and let an opportunity slide by. And I'm really not talking about possibly the blessing that may have come out of obedience, but just doing the right thing at the right time for the right reason with the right intention. When I think about assignments, 
They could be a duty or a responsibility, but they also could be a project, a report, a lesson, maybe something that you turn in, hand in to be graded. It reminds me of a story that I heard, and I don't really know the location, but it's a Christian institution. And the assignment that the kids were given, or the students I should say, I believe they might have been college age, was to bring in a simple blank sheet of paper and a pencil. That's all the assignment was. So sure enough, every student came prepared, showed up on time, seated with their blank piece of paper and their pencil. The instruction that they were given was to think for a moment of somebody that had wronged them. Somebody that did something that wasn't justified. It was kind of just that simple. And then the instructor asked them to draw that person on the picture. And the professor kind of observed the different responses to the people. Some people drew caricatures that distorted maybe a large nose or big ears or something that just really kind of poked fun at what they looked like. And others with great detail, as an artist would, etched a perfect sketching of what that person's profile looked like. So he asked all the students to stand up in a single file line towards the front of the classroom, each with their paper in hand. So one by one, uh, the first student was able to hang their picture on an easel on the wall and was handed three darts. And so the opportunity was given to seek revenge on that person that had wronged them. And again, this professor observed as some people used all their brute force to wing that dart as hard as they can. All that pent up hostility could finally be vented and exact revenge on that person without doing any really physical bodily harm to anyone. <laughs> So while some, again, used as much strength as they could garnish up and winged with the velocity that they could generate towards that dartboard, then they would remove the three darts, remove their paper, come back in line and hand the three darts to the next student. And this continued on. And again, while some used strength, others used precision. It's like they were trying to strike right for the eyes or right for a portion of that picture. And again, mind you, this is a Christian setting, a Christian university. Finally, after about a dozen students or so get through, the professor said, okay, stop. We're done. There was still half the classroom that hadn't had this opportunity. And again, he observed as the first half you know, had this satisfaction of finally getting back and finally exacting revenge. And the others were highly upset and caught themselves being vexated. Everybody got their turn, I didn't get mine. He had them sit down and continued to see half of the classroom satisfied and at peace. In the other half of the room, their feathers ruffled as if they had been unjustly taken away the opportunity that was rightfully theirs. And then there was a holy hush in that classroom. As that professor walked back up to that dartboard and removed the pictures and the blank piece of paper that had covered it. And there was a precious portrait of our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he uttered the same words we read just moments ago. When you've done this to the least of my brothers, you've done this to me. And that picture of our Lord and Savior was maimed, distorted, torn, 
and almost beyond recognition. So it hurts my heart to think, what would I have done in that situation? Would I have been the one that... I'm not an artist, I can't draw a stick figure, and it really doesn't matter because it would really be the intent of the heart. You know, who would I have picked on that picture? And what would my response been? Would I have wailed those darts as hard as I could? Would I have tried to strike with precision to affect some sort of bodily injury if it was really in, in the case? Or... Would I be in the one grumbling in the back of the room that didn't get the chance? I don't know. I don't know. I would like to think that I would have been bigger than that, that I would have seen it for what it was, that maybe while standing in line and praying that God would have showed me, hey, don't, don't fall for the trick of the enemy. Don't allow yourself to be deceived. See this for what it is. I just don't know. So I ask, what is, what is your assignment? What is my assignment? What are we here for? I believe that each and every one of us has a gift, a plan, and a purpose that has been orchestrated by God from the beginning of time. And I believe it is our duty, in obedience, to walk that out. With a right spirit, with a pure heart, and a cheerful countenance. I think of the story of Mary and Martha when Jesus came to visit. And how Mary was so excited and it was just ready to take advantage of this opportunity to sit at the Lord's feet and, and hear what he had to impart. And I think of Martha getting caught up in the, the busy work of, of life and just trying to make everything perfect and, you know, sweep that floor one last time and straighten the curtains and just make the perfect setting. After all, this is our Lord and Savior coming to visit. And again, I put myself in that situation and wonder, what, which, one am, which one am I? I know my tendencies. I know I try to make everything just right or if I've got an extra few seconds to catch that dust on the nightstand real quick or maybe I should run and get a glass of water surely he'd want a glass of water and I might miss the very most important thing that he might say because I'm trying to make something perfect for the one who is perfect I think of Abraham and the test that he endured. I've got a son, 12 years old. I couldn't imagine. I could not fathom answering the call like Abraham did. Again, in the natural, I'm sitting there thinking, surely this is not the voice of God. Surely he would not ask me to do something. This has got to be the trick of the enemy. I mean, the Bible says he'd deceive the very elect if it were possible, right? I'm sure I'm not the only one that thinks of things like this. When, when you read the Bible and just wonder... What if I was that person? How would I have responded? I look at Esther, who was born for such a time as this, and stood up in a time to save her people. Again, in the face of adversity. I draw great strength from these men and women of God. These real-life people. I mean, sometimes we might look at them as superheroes, heroes of the faith. But the fact of the matter is, they were real people just like us. Tax collectors, fishermen. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. But we are going to face tests. And we will face trials. And what I've tried to learn, and I tell you the truth, I have not perfected this in the least. 
But what I've tried to, especially when things just look overwhelming, is to stop for a second and to pause and ask the Lord, what is my assignment here? I mean, surely none of this catches him by surprise. He knows the end from the beginning. But whatever you might be facing, especially when it feels overwhelming and there's nowhere else to turn, we know with God all things are possible. We know that he answers prayer. We know that he's still in the miracle working business. And we know that he desires to use us in situations and circumstances to bring glory to his name, to bring others into the fold, to get more names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So what is your assignment? Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I find this chapter so encouraging. Especially when I was a young Christian, but even now that I'm a little more seasoned, I still feel like I'm in my youthful years as a Christian. It's so powerful to realize that each and every one of us has a part to play. Let's start at verse 12. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. It says, For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, we have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not the body, is it therefore not the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing? If the whole were hearing, then where the smelling? But now hath God set members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? And now there are many members, but yet one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need for thee. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more than the members of the body, which seem to be more feeble or necessary. And those members of the body, which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to the part which lacked that there should be no schism in the body, but that what members should have the same care for another. And whether one member suffereth, all members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all members rejoice with it. Now we are the body of Christ and members in particular. I think I just pause here uh, real quickly. Um, I am thrilled um, to hear, and I've only heard just a snippet, as you have too. Um, but I'm thankful for Brother Mario uh, returning safely. Amen. I don't like to rush God, but I do look forward to two Sabbaths from now when, when Brother Mario will get the chance to share his experiences. I'm glad to have been a part, not only financially, but prayerfully, um, as you all have. And I'm thankful that we have a part in it. I'm encouraged by the fact that being able to support those that are doing the work, we can't all go on the mission field. We can't all be up here ministering. We can't all play the piano. We can't all sing. But we all have something to bring a supply to the body. There's not one person here present today that doesn't have something to contribute. And as we just read here, it doesn't mean because one 
part of the body might be used more prevalently then it makes it any more important than the other. God instructs us that we're to be made every whit whole. And when one of our members is missing or hurting, we should be hurting along with that person. We are there to support and to uplift one another. And that's what I appreciate about our church family here. Uh, during my studies this week, I came across a devotional uh, that I've been reading by Sister White. Um, and it actually um, coincided with the day that I got asked to, to speak today. Um, and I'd just like to sh share it with you because I, I, I think it's an integral part of, of what I'm trying to convey or what the Lord impressed upon me to convey today. The title of this devotional is called Putting Our Gifts to Work. The scripture cited is 1 Corinthians 7 and 7 and says, But every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. She goes on to say, God gives more than money to his, to his stewards. Your talent in imparting is a gift. What are you communicating the gift of God in your words and in your tender sympathy? The knowledge of truth is a talent. There are many souls in darkness that might be enlightened by true faithful words from you. There are hearts that are hungering for sympathy, perishing away from God. Your sympathy may help them. The Lord has need of your words dictated by His Holy Spirit. The first work of all Christians is to do a search of the scriptures for earnest prayer. That they may have the faith that work by love and that purifies the soul from every thread of selfishness. If the truth is received into the heart, it works like good leaven. Until every power is brought into subjection to the will of God, then you can no more help shining than the sun. All natural gifts are to be sanctified as precious endorsements. They are to be consecrated to God, that they may minister for the Master. All social advantages are talents. They are not to be devoted to self-pleasing, amusements, or self-gratification. The gift of correct example is a great thing, but many gather about the soul in atmosphere that is malarious. The gifts of speech, of knowledge, of sympathy, of love, communicate a knowledge of Christ. All these gifts are to be converted to God. The Lord stands in need of them. He calls for them. All are to act a part in preparing their own souls and the souls of others to rededicate their talents to God. For every soul, every gift is to be laid under the contribution to God. All are to cooperate with God in the work of saving souls. The talents you possess are given you to make you efficient co-laborers with Christ. There are hearts hungering for sympathy, perishing for help, and assistance God has given you to give to them. Amen. We are charged to diligently seek to make our calling an election sure. The last time I had the opportunity to speak, I was quite nervous, and I'm not going to tell you that I'm not still. Um, but one thing that I forgot in concluding the message was to solicit your prayers um, the next week because I was about to embark upon a short-term missions trip with my son Josiah uh, down to Houston um, in conjunction with his school, Church Alive Christian School, and YWAM, which is Youth with a Mission. And we had a fantastic time. Um, wonderful opportunities to minister in the third ward of Houston. Uh, which is pretty poverty-stricken, and um, there's 
there's a lot of bad things that go on in that part of town. And one thing that I kind of embarked upon or in preparing for the trip um, was really, again, to seek what my assignment was. Why am I going? I mean, other than the will willingness to help. Why are you choosing me to go on this trip to this location with this group of people to work with these ministries to minister to whom? And so I spent the bulk of my time trying to pray and really trying to exercise the spirit of discernment to answer a situation that maybe if I just go in and all the joy of going and, and having a good time and being a part of, of some great work, really missing the mark of what's your responsibility here? I think uh, one of the most satisfying parts of this trip um, was actually watching my son uh, kind of break out of his shell. Um, it was his first trip. He was able to participate in a couple of dramas. And uh, it was really great to see him use some gifts and talents that maybe hadn't been utilized before uh, for his glory. And I'm speaking specifically of a time that we went to uh, the projects on the north end of town. And we were partnered with a, a ministry called CAT Ministries. And CAT is actually an ac acronym for Church Activity Truck. And what this truck is, it's a regular box truck, but half of it folds down into a stage. So they actually have a, a mobile church. Um, they drive it right into the, the hard top of the black top of the parking lot and they lay out some blue tarp and uh, the kids come and there's rules that they have to stay on the tarp during the whole service and participate and not be distracted and really and truly this is really the only church these kids get to go to because their folks don't bring them to church. Um, so they come by the tens. We probably had between 50 and 100 kids um, ranging from infants all the way up to I guess middle school age. Now we had a captive audience. There were still older folks around, but on the periphery, kind of scowling and checking it out, but just wanted to see what's going on, but really weren't interested in us being there, what we had to say, but still checking it out. So I was encouraged by the fact that as the service con concluded um, that the invitation was for anybody that desired prayer uh, to come forward, that we had plenty of people there to go ahead and pray for those people. And again, I was asking God, what is my responsibility here? I mean, I'm keeping my eye on my son. Um, but at the same time, I was kind of surveying the crowd, you know. Nobody was there because they had to be there, no matter what their body language may have dictated. And I was kind of directed my attention to two teenage kids in the back. And uh, I'm going to be honest, I kind of resisted the urge. It was like, you know, they didn't want to be bothered. I could tell. Their body language said so. And I'm on their turf, so to speak. But I still felt some kind of tugging in my heart that you need to make contact. And I'd love to say I obediently walked over there and, and uh, introduced myself and prayed for them. And it wasn't until somebody else directed my attention to them. One of the directors of CAP Ministry just kind of caught my attention and shot me a look and shot a look at them and the message was delivered. So while that was confirmation I was gonna, supposed to go pray for them, um, I... I resisted that unction, if you will. So I went over and made contact with the two young men, and one of them thought it was a joke, and, you know, he needs Jesus, and la, la, la. I wasn't going to let it slide at that, because I saw something in the other young man. And he kind of laughed at the kid's joke. The first kid felt uncomfortable, and he wandered away, actually, just around the corner, so he was still in an earshot. And this young man said, I asked him, is there anything you'd like to pray for? He said, yeah. I want to find my dad. And that just 
hit me in my heart. I mean, this kid was serious. He just wanted to know who his dad was. And I asked him, I said, if you had that opportunity, what would you ask him? I said, it'd be simple. Are you my dad? He just wanted to know. And so I did pray for him, and I would love to tell you a happy story that I've connected with him, and he found his dad, and they've been reunited, and I don't know, God knows the end to this story. But there was an opportunity to share with him that he does have a Heavenly Father that can play that role in his life, to extend to the love to him of that vacuum in his life. And really my point wasn't to share that story, but what really warmed my heart was after it was over to connect with my son Josiah and just ask him, you know, hey, how did, how did that go? And he said, went fine. I prayed. Do you remember the kid's name? We've since forgotten his name, but he prayed for a young man and he said he wanted prayer because his cousin just got killed. And he wanted prayer for himself and his family. And I know we do this all the time. We get phone calls. We have a bulletin with a whole list of names of people on the back that are in need of prayer. We have social media. It's very easy to put out a prayer request. And boy, within minutes, I mean, we could literally have hundreds of people all over the nation, all over the world praying for our petition. And I think we need to utilize that. But there's a key to being obedient when these opportunities present themselves for us to answer obediently. Don't put it off. Oh yeah, I'll remember y'all. I'll pray for, I'll be praying for you. And I'm talking to me now. A lot of times I do that. I'm guilty of saying, hey, I'll I'll be praying for you. Right there, right then. There's no distance in prayer. We can address that wheresoever two or three are gathered in your name. There he is in the midst. God answers prayers. I'm going to tell on myself, uh, I had an incident that happened about a month ago. Um, some of you know my, my job has me travel more than I would ever like. Not, not terribly too much, but several times during the month I'll take day-long trips. Um, I've got clients up in the Kansas City area and Tulsa area, so that's not too far. I mean, it's a round trip, and I've got some up in Topeka. Anyway, this particular morning I was headed to Kansas City. And um, just like all of you, I'm sure you say prayers as you get out onto the road, never know what you're going to face. I have a poor habit when I'm taking a long-distance trip to wait before I get on the interstate. There's just something about, okay, now this trip is beginning. And uh, again, a poor habit on my part because <laughs> there's a distance between my front driveway and, and the interstate. This particular morning, I left a little earlier than normal. It was right about 7 o'clock. And I was traveling um, east on Highway P. And so at that time, you imagine the sun is glaring right into my eyes. So I'm driving very gingerly, more, more so than, than normal, uh, because I really can't see more than 50 feet in front of me. So I'm not driving the speed limit. I come to the very first intersection of P and NN. And so I, you know, glance to the north and I see a, a truck coming southbound and you know what? He's got a clear shot. Um, the sun's not in his eyes and he does the little Hollywood stop or maybe out in this part of, part of the country we call it a farmer stop where you just kind of tap the brake and he comes right through the intersection. I mean, the stop sign, 7 in the morning. I don't know if he looked and glanced and didn't see anything. I don't know if I was closer than he thought. And I mean, he didn't slow down. I mean, he just tapped that brake. And I mean, he was headed right for my door. And so I grabbed that steering wheel, rode that horn as hard as I could, and turned the veer out of his direction. And to be honest with you, I closed my eyes and braced for impact. I mean, I thought surely he was going to hit me. Um, car stopped right before going going down into a ditch, and um, 
I can't believe it. And I'm so thankful I didn't utter anything I shouldn't have. <laughs> um, I thank God for that. <laughs> Immediately went into prayer. And the prayer that I should have prayed before I left the, the driveway. Uh, started to pray, Lord, I just thank you uh, for your hand of protection. I ask you to dispatch angels around and about my vehicle as I head to my destination. And I corrected myself and I said, Lord, you've already dispatched angels around this vehicle. Because there's really no physical explanation for us not have collided. So you obviously have angels. I'm just asking for a few more because I don't know what I'm going to encounter up to Kansas City and back. Um, and so once again, I, and, and so anyway, just to further the story, uh, kept on going. I, our eyes met in his rearview mirror. And the look of disbelief on, on that driver's face was kind of like, what's wrong with you? What are you honking at me for? I mean, this man clearly never saw me at all. Like I wasn't there. And while my perspective was much different, his was just like, you having a bad day? You're honking at me? I'm, I'm minding my own business? And again, I sat back, and, and I know God did this to me. How many times, I mean, because he clearly didn't see me. There was nothing that alerted him to my presence ever until I honked my horn. And I wonder how many times I've been that person that just didn't see somebody. I mean, I'm not even talking about just driving. I mean, how many times, I don't know, maybe you're like me. Has anybody ever been to Walmart shopping around and they see somebody that maybe they haven't seen in a while or whatever and have a real clutch close brush with them and they just keep on walking and it's like they didn't even say hi nothing and it's like I mean we, we were five feet apart and they just kept on going and you're like I don't they had to have seen me um, have you ever had that happen I'm seeing a couple of heads shake yes and I wonder how many times I've turned around and done the same thing and, and I'm the topic of the dinner table I saw Steve Schett in Walmart he walked right past and didn't say a word I don't know what's going on with him I have no idea what I could have possibly done to him for him not to say hello didn't even acknowledge me and so I say that all to say this, you know, can we be blind sometimes to what's right there before us? Again, I ask, what is our assignment? I see the time's getting late, so I'm going to conclude with uh, one of the best finishers of, of all time. Um, we all know the story of Stephen being stoned. And he graciously, in his final utters of breath, says, lay this sin not to their charge. I mean, what a wonderful way to finish your assignment serving for Christ as a first martyr. I think about Paul. When he was Saul, he didn't start off so good. I mean, he thought he did. He thought he was doing something right, um, but has his encounter on Damascus, and in Acts uh, chapter 20, he's able to utter the words, I've finished my course, I have not shunned to teach you the whole gospel. I mean, what a great way to finish. But again, the greatest finisher of all time, and I know these weren't his last words that he uttered here on earth. But John chapter 17, we know our Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane prays this wonderful prayer. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour come. Glorify thy Son, and thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life as to many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work that thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, 
and thou gavest me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. And I have given unto them the words which thou gavest unto me, and have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they believe that thou didst send me. I pray for them, I pray not for the world, but for them that thou hast given me, for they are thine, and all are mine, and all are thine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come unto thee, Holy Father, keep thou thine own name, whose thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in the name that these that they gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now I come to thee, and these things I speak to the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shalt take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So what is your assignment? Let's bring this thing full circle. Brother Gary was kind enough to read the opening scripture. And let me just repeat it. Mark chapter 10 verses 6 and 7. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely as ye have received, freely give. Amen. What is your assignment? Church, there's a dying world out there, and we are charged with the responsibility of replicating the character of Christ to share the gospel. What is your assignment? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. What is your assignment? To love your neighbor as yourself. What is your assignment? Preach the gospel in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke with all long suffering. What is your assignment? For here's the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Amen. I'd like you guys to join me in singing our closing hymn. Number 530. It is well with my soul. Thank you, Jane. Number 530. It is well with my soul. Please stand. like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say it is well it is well with
is complete. But I would charge you with this assignment should you choose to accept it. Let's take the next seven days and search and seek out an opportunity to just go above and beyond. Do something more than what you normally would. Look for the opportunity to have a chance encounter with someone that's not by accident. God arranges our situations, our circumstances, our destinations, and our paths to get there. And I too will accept that challenge and hopefully next Sabbath we'll have stories to share of how we've brought glory to his name. Please bow your heads. Heavenly Father, I just thank you and I praise you again for this wonderful day. I thank you for your word. I thank you for each and every one of your precious promises. I thank you, Lord, for being that great example, Lord, of how to have heaven here on earth. I thank you, Lord, that you were tempted in all points like we were, but yet without sin. And I thank you, Lord, for making that ultimate.